Hey everybody, my name is Ananya Joshi, and today we're going to be talking about neuromarketing. Uh, and the previous presenter talked a bit about Cambridge Analytica, but I just wanted to share this quote, which says, we are thrilled that our revolutionary approach to data-driven communications is making such a vital contribution to the Donald Trump's victory. Uh, and they said this shortly after the election, and this kind of sets the tone for this talk. Now, I want us to watch this quick video. It's an awareness test, and you're going to be asked to see how many times the basketball is passed by the white team. If you already know the study, don't say anything. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! Okay, anybody, the answer. Oh, anybody have the answer? How many passes? 12 or 13? That's correct. I see some smiles, so some people know this trick already, but. Did anybody notice something funny during the video? Sorry? Oh, hey, that might be the case. Uh, I don't know about that. But in this video, <laughs> there's, a, there's a bear right here, and the bear is moonwalking. Uh, and he's there for a lot of the video. We just don't see him because we're focused on the white team. And so what this goes to show is that although our brains are really powerful, there are some basic psychological concepts that can be exploited. Um, and these tricks are commonly seen in optical illusions. And so our brain is sometimes called by neuromarketers as the reptilian brain because these old structures that have come through evolution can still trip us up, just like in the previous video. In fact, in the official experiment, only about 8% of people were able to detect the strange animal in the video. And so psychology is pretty important, and technology can enhance the effects of psychology. These can be either good or bad. For example, some good uses of persuasive technology, which is technology applied to psychology, uh, are the health app, which encourages you to be healthy, or the calm app, which gives you the tools to meditate properly. However, it can also be bad. For example, if your vote uh, goes to a person that you didn't want to vote for before, or if you get addicted to some sort of online gaming. So some cool examples of persuasive technology are apps that help people keep their doctor's appointments by providing the right incentives, or computers that can evaluate lawyers' arguments, and finally, the influence that politicians with fake followers have on how credible they seem. So today we'll be focusing on neuromarketing, which is a small subset of persuasive technology, uh, and it's formally known as neuroscience applied to marketing. And marketing is considered a subjective field, and neuromarketing tries to make the subjective field more objective. Um, we'll be talking about neuroscience, marketing, uh, and the ethics for both of them together. And so I want us to talk through an example right now of targeted marketing. Say that you really like dogs, and you commonly use these apps like Facebook and Google and Microsoft, and you provide them with your search engines, your search terms, you search about dog adoption, and you watch a dog video. Then on YouTube, you might see an ad that says, dog tested, dog approved, and it's for this car. If you are to buy a car in the near future, it's likely that you're going to buy the car that you've most recently seen. And it's even more likely because of neuromarketing. Neuromarketing has studied some important concepts that are seen in this video. For example, we know that you might like dogs, and neuromarketing shows that when you like something and that gaze is looking at something else, you're also likely to like the third product. So in this case, you are more likely to like the car because the dogs are looking at it. Also, if an advertiser were to know that you're looking for a car that can uh, go through rough terrain uh, or that you're into nature, this ad is particularly powerful. It capitalizes on the nature of the dog, that's a companion, that it provides protection, but it also is personalized to you, the fact that you might have a friend's dog that you like or that you live near a dog park. And this in here highlights the difference between marketing and neuromarketing. Marketing, the concept is quite simple. 
you want to use a product like Facebook and Spotify, but you don't pay for these products. Instead, what Facebook and Spotify and Google do is that they sell space on their website to companies like IKEA, who then put their ads in the space, and that's what you see. In neuromarketing, you give your data to companies. These companies give it to uh, advertisers at a higher price because your data is quite valuable. Then the advertisers pick and choose which individuals they want to market to, and you get the data back from them. Additionally, in neuromarketing, if you're involved in the trials that come up with neuromarketing concepts, your brain is scanned, and that data is also available and not really protected. So how does this really work? The psychology behind it is quite interesting. So there was a study done that asked people whether they preferred Coca-Cola or Pepsi. And when people were just asked, there was no clear winner. But when the um, subjects were put inside of fMRI machines, what researchers saw was that their frontal lobe was activated, uh, and there was more blood rushing to it when the words Coke were seen. That probably accounts for why Coca-Cola is so much more, uh, has more sales than Pepsi does. And this effect was studied across several other disciplines. Like in music, you can predict which music people will like through the same psychology. Further, the amygdala and the hippocampus were also activated. And this is really key because other products like the Facebook like button, the messenger button, addictive games, and gambling also use these psychological structures, and they're quite addictive. In fact, one article um, said that they were more addictive than cocaine, which is pretty powerful. And as we discussed before, this really comes back to the attention economy. One research paper put it best by saying, companies are fighting for some real estate on your frontal lobe. And that's exactly what companies today are trying to do. They don't really care right now directly about your money. They care about making that brand so that you will continue to subscribe to the brand in the future. The technology is also quite interesting. There are over 300 companies that are dedicated to neuromarketing. And they use these EEGs, eye trackers, uh, like sensors to detect the sweat off your skin and your hormones to determine what you really think about an ad. And what they're interested in is this effect called priming, which as soon as you hear about a brand, what happens in your brain? Um, as you mentioned before with Coke, that brand name is very strong. If we think back to the very first video I showed, it was from these people, Simons and Chabriz. And one thing I noticed that was really interesting in their paper was that it said unnoticed stimuli in the static inattentional blindness paradigm can lead to priming effects. They said this in 1999. The implication is that what we may see today in ads, in passing, something that we're not even paying attention to, can really establish the brand. Meaning that ads are super crucial and can actually influence sales quite well. Some major actors in the field of your marketing include like Facebook, Google AdWords, uh, companies like AppNexus, and neuromarketing agencies that are dedicated to neuro neuromarketing, like brain sites. So who are the key stakeholders? We have the neuromarketing firms, like brain sites. We have the government. We have advertisers, like IKEA. We have customers, you and me. And we have agencies like Google that facilitate the whole ad auction process. And so it's important to note that there are connections between all of these groups. Uh, and that the incentives are really imbalanced. The government has to both protect people and encourage business. It's really difficult to find a nice way for everyone to win um, and to protect everyone's interests. And so here's a bit, about, a bit more about specific interests. The, the neuromarketing firms, they have a strong research focus. They want to know what's going on inside the brain. They also care about making money. <laughs> they get the money from advertisers whose main goal is to increase the number of customers while saving money. The agencies, like Google, care about how many advertisers are coming through their process. The government attempts to protect both businesses and the public. And you, the customer, are probably most concerned with getting the products that you care about, as well as protecting your privacy. And so we're going to focus on four key ethical questions. The first is privacy violation. There's four definitions of privacy, but the ones that we're going to focus today are mostly personal privacy in neuromarketing. 
So imagine that you are using a search engine. What happens if you have a rare disease that you haven't told anyone about and your family member uses a search engine as well? And through the ads, they are able to detect that you have this disease. Is that a violation of your privacy? Well, it could be. And there are many other questions about privacy violations. Uh, in the previous talk, we talked about Cambridge Analytica. And I just wanted to share a few interesting uh, different ideas about Cambridge Analytica. So the first is that they, when they create the profiles, they don't just stop there. They create ads specific to the profile. Uh, in one article, they said that for anxious people, they have a picture of a burglary happening, happening right next to a picture of a son and a father shooting ducks in the sky to make the correlation in some user's mind that weapons are good uh, because I can have fun and I can protect myself. So these correlations were also exploited by Cambridge Analytica. Further, um, Facebook has in the past sold, uh, has used users' data without their permission. Uh, I know the previous presenter mentioned some of them, but another is that in 2011, they took thousands of data points about users' mood and used them for research with almost no backlash. The final thing I want to point out is that some articles that pointed, that talked about the impact of Cambridge Analytica on the US election came out as early as December 2016. Right now it's 2018 and the news is only breaking. So it's clear that even though people know that there is something wrong and this has been a question for a long time, nothing really has been done about it, which is why it's important for us to question these things further. The second question is about stealth neuromarketing. And this has been one of the major focus of all the neuroethics papers I've been reading about. Before we talk about this, it's important to know a study about rats. So in a study, rats were given the option to press a sensor that activated their, um, their pleasure hormones in their brain. And so they chose pressing that sensor over eating, sleeping, and oftentimes some of those rats even died. What does that mean? Does that mean that if something interests us enough, that if it um, causes hormones to be released, that we would just do it automatically? Well, one of the main issues with stealth neuromarketing that was pointed out is what happens when we become robots to advertising? Will companies treat us worse? Will companies charge us more money for the same products? It's not clear, but one thing is for certain is that you need to know yourself quite well in order to survive what stealth neuromarketing might bring. One article said that with 110 of your public likes on Facebook, a company can know you better than your parents do. With 300 likes on Facebook, a company can know you better than your partner does. So it's projected that with a few hundred likes, a company can know you even better than you know yourself. What does that mean when you see ads? When you see ads without your consent, like, you don't ask to go on Facebook and see ads, but you still do. So this is another big question. The third is the communication standard. What happens when people are insecure and they're vulnerable to these ads that makes them purchase more, that makes them spend more, that's bad for them? What are the ethical implications of that? Or for children who are getting addicted to online gambling, is there a way uh, that neuromarketing should be regulated to stop things like this, or not? Finally, there's the question of the ethics of the field. And this is the second topic that most of the neuroethics papers focus on. They want to preserve the field, but there's still a lot of questions. For example, a lot of neuromarketing agencies say that there is a buy button in the brain, and that's what they're trying to do their research on. They're trying to find that way of, if you see this, you will buy that, not just probabilistically, but deterministically. Um, but this may or may not exist. So there are some problems with the field at large. Further, if you go get your brain scanned for these consumer neuroscience agencies, in the US at least, your brain data is not protected. Imagine if a future employer got hold of your brain scan and could see what is going on. It's important for um, your data and your brain and this field as a whole to question is what we're doing okay? 
And one interesting quote uh, that was from several years back says, the nation is in the midst of an epidemic of marketing-related diseases. Uh, and this is in relation to a study from Emory University about neuromarketing. But it shows that there are some really big questions that need to be asked. There are also quite a few manifestos online about how we should solve this neuroethics crisis. And it comes down to seven key points. We need to protect our research subjects. Your brain, once it gets, once it gets scanned, needs to be protected. We also need to protect niche populations. Children, for example, shouldn't be exposed to neuromarketing, nor should people who are um, psychologically vulnerable. Third, there needs to be a full disclosure of goals, risks, and benefits. Fourth, there needs to be an accurate representation of the agencies, as mentioned previously. Some agencies say there is a buy button, but there's not a lot of psychological evidence for that. Fifth, there needs to be consent, whether it's your consent to see ads that are targeted to you or consent of the experimenters to have this experimentation done on them. The sixth is the validity of research, which concepts are correct, which concepts are not. And seventh is subject incorporation, um, which is basically if you have an ad for men's body wash and you're only targeting men, you still need to think about how females would react to that ad. And so it's important to have this broad view still about marketing. And so some future projections, my future projections, this is all personal, based on um, the content that we've seen is one, we're going to see less ads because they're going to be more powerful. And they're going to come through us through a bunch of different media. It's going to come audio ads. We're going to see um, like virtual reality and augmented reality ads. But I really think there will be fewer of them if neuromarketing is um, done properly. The second is I don't believe that there will be an overall international standard for bioethics and for neuromarketing, but I do believe that we won't have issues like this right now. So right now in the United States, we can see that tobacco retailers are targeting low-income neighborhoods. But I believe in the future, based on where neuromarketing is heading, some countries will protect their vulnerable populations, while others might not. And finally, right now, neuromarketing is really expensive. It costs thousands of dollars to get fMRI imaging. Uh, and right now, only really big companies can afford this, like Google or Lays. Because of that, I do believe for some time, it will be that the more money you have, the more neuromarketing research you can afford, the better your product will be. And this would cause some implications economically with um, monopolies. And so for the last segment, these are just some things to think about. The first is loyalty reward programs. They collect your data and it's tied to your name. And it's not something that's quite obvious like Facebook or Google. There are other ways that your data is being physically collected and your habits are being observed. So it's important to be aware of that. The other thing is that there is a psychological concept that says if you make your decision, if you think in advance about what you're going to do, let's say today I think about who I'm going to vote for in four years or what characteristics this person might have, I'll be less susceptible, I'll be less vulnerable to neuromarketing campaigns. And that's also something to be considerate of. And third, there are options on almost all of your apps to limit ad tracking, and it's important to know what these features are and whether you want to see them or not. There are also some real benefits to neuromarketing. First, if you see ads that are more targeted to you, you're likely to discover new products that you hadn't known before. Second, if neuromarketing really does take off, many of the research papers predict that ads do go down because they're so powerful. Instead of seeing thousands of ads in one day, it's approximately we see 10,000 ads one day, you might only see two or three if they're done properly. And finally, neuromarketing is one of the strongest incentives to study the brain further. And there's a lot of money in this field, so it's really good for science. Some courses of action potentially are to really evaluate how you use products like Facebook and Google. Second, to be familiar with the laws in your region about how your data or your brain is being protected. And finally, I'm not suggesting you, you fight with the computer, but you're just more aware of how your data is used and what you can do about it. So here are my sources, and here are some questions, but I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you.